Every year, in late winter, millions of Catholics and Protestants participate in raucous Mardi Gras celebrations, attend church services on Ash Wednesday, and then observe 40 days of Lent. They attend Easter sunrise worship services, take their children on an Easter egg hunt, pose for a few pictures with the Easter bunny, and then gather at the dining room table to feast on a traditional Easter ham and hot cross buns. People rarely stop to ask where these traditions came from and what they represent. Most people don't even realize that Jesus and the apostles didn't observe these customs and didn't teach their followers to keep them. In fact, the Bible clearly condemns these traditions. In this video, we will present three clear reasons why Christians shouldn't observe Easter. The first point is that Easter is inherently pagan. For thousands of years prior to the birth of Jesus, pagans worshipped fertility deities and sun gods that died each fall after the harvest and were reborn or resurrected at the winter solstice or vernal equinox. As empires rose and fell, the gods and myths of the defeated were reinvented and absorbed into the pantheon of the victors. This process is called syncretism, and the ancient Romans were experts in assimilation. After the first century, many Romans became Christians in name only. They brought many pagan traditions and symbols with them that were gradually blended into the early Catholic Church. Christmas, New Year's Day, Valentine's Day, Easter, May Day, and Halloween all contain elements that were borrowed from ancient paganism. For example, there are many parallels between the Roman worship of Sybil and Attis and the Catholic worship of Mary and Jesus. Sybil was the Phrygian goddess of fertility. The Romans called Sybil the Magna Mater, the Great Mother, and the Mater Deum, the Mother of the Gods. The priests of Sybil were unique in the Roman Empire because they were eunuchs. The Vestal Virgins were also celibate, but they were not castrated priests. Like all religions in the Roman Empire, the cult of Sybil was managed by the College of Pontiffs, which was led by the Pontificus Maximus, the chief high priest in ancient Rome. Attis was a god of vegetation, associated with death and resurrection. He was worshipped in Asia Minor and later throughout the Roman Empire. Many different accounts of Attis's life and death exist. According to one story, Nana, the mother of Attis, conceived by a miracle without sexual relations. As Attis grew, his long-haired beauty was godlike, and Sybil fell in love with him. When Sybil discovered that Attis had been unfaithful, she killed her rival. Driven to madness, Attis then wounded himself under a pine tree and bled to death. As a result, the earth's plant life ceased to grow, so the gods agreed that Attis should be resurrected each spring. In this way, he came to be associated with the cycle of the seasons, dying in the winter and being reborn in the spring. The worship of Sybil and Attis occurred during an extended festival or Holy Week that lasted from March 15th to March 28th. On March 15th was the Cana Intrat, the reed enters, when worshippers gathered and carried reeds to mark the birth of Attis and the start of Holy Week. March 22nd was Arbor Intrat, the tree enters. This day commemorated the death of Attis under a pine tree. The tree bearers cut down a tree, suspended an image of Attis from it, and carried it to the temple for burial. A three-day period of mourning followed. March 25th is the Hilaria, or Rejoicing. This is the day of the vernal equinox on the Roman calendar, 
when Attis was reborn. Some early Christian sources equate this day with the resurrection of Jesus. March 27th was the Lavatio, or washing, when Sybil's image was taken, in procession, from the Palatine Temple, down the Appian Way, to the Almond Stream, for a ritual washing. There are so many parallels with the worship of Attis that there was violent conflict on Vatican Hill in the early days of Christianity between the Jesus worshipers and pagans who quarreled over whose God was the true and whose the imitation. The situation is so blatantly obvious that several Protestant Christian denominations, including Lutherans and Quakers, have opted to formally abandon many Easter traditions, deeming them too pagan. However, many religious observers of Easter also include them in their celebrations. The English term Easter comes from Eoster, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring, also known as Ostara in Old High German. In the 8th century, Bede wrote that during the month Eosternmonap, the equivalent of April, pagan Anglo-Saxons had held feasts in Eoster's honor, but that this tradition had died out by his time, replaced by the Christian celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Scholars have linked the goddess's name to over 150 inscriptions from the 2nd century A.D., referring to the Matrone Austria Hene, female deities venerated in northwestern Europe. Eoster is also a distant cognate of numerous other goddesses mentioned by other Indo-European-speaking peoples, where she was called the goddess of the dawn and the daughter of heaven. This is a clear example of syncretism, a violation of God's law and a gross insult to Yahweh, the God of Israel. All of God's Sabbaths and feast days have biblical names reflecting their Hebraic origins, such as Pesach, which we call Passover, Shavuot, which is Pentecost, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 13, God told the Israelites, Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Also in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 3, God commanded the Israelites, Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and burn their Asherah poles in the fire. Cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 2, God predicted, on that day, I will banish the names of the idols from the land, and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. The cartoonish and highly commercialized Easter Bunny is a relatively recent invention that grew out of medieval German folklore and ancient superstitions that associate rabbits with fertility and the coming of spring. Contrary to popular belief, there is no evidence connecting Eoster with an egg-laying Easter hare. But the Bible clearly commands Christians to avoid foolish myths and superstitions. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Paul wrote, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogy. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Also, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul wrote, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion, in traditional folk religion, the egg is a powerful symbol of fertility, purity, and rebirth. All over the world, it represents life and creation, fertility and resurrection. In early times, 
eggs were interred with the dead. Later, they were linked with Easter. The church did not oppose this, though many egg customs were pre-Christian in origin because the egg provided a fresh and powerful symbol of the resurrection and the transformation of death into life. This is consistent with what the Apostle Paul predicted in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, where he wrote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. The Encyclopedia of Religion also says that the Easter ham is popular among Europeans and Americans because the pig was considered a symbol of luck in pre-Christian European culture. But God doesn't fellowship with apostates who break his laws. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus said, On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name, and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, the Apostle Paul also wrote, Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Hot cross buns are another relic of paganism and superstition. The Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology says, Although the cross symbolized the crucifixion, it had a more ancient origin. The cross was also a pagan symbol, and it was used by the Anglo-Saxons to indicate the four seasons on loaves baked for the vernal equinox, and to discourage evil spirits that might prevent bread from rising. As a Christian symbol, the buns derive from the ecclesiastical consecrated loaves given in churches as alms, and to those who could not take communion. They were given by the priest to the people after the Mass, before the congregation was dismissed. They were to be kissed before being eaten. According to Wikipedia, English folklore includes many superstitions surrounding hot cross buns. One of them says that buns baked and served on Good Friday will not spoil or grow moldy during the subsequent year. Another encourages keeping such a bun for medicinal purposes. A piece of it given to someone ill is said to help them recover. If taken on a sea voyage, hot cross buns are said to protect against shipwreck. If hung in the kitchen, they are said to protect against fires and ensure that all breads turn out perfectly. So we see that the hot cross bun was associated with pre-Christian paganism, folklore, and superstition. The second point is that God forbids any pagan worship practices. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29, Moses told Israel, When the Lord your God cuts off before you, the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land. Take care that you do not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods, that I also may do the same? You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, the Apostle Paul warned Christians, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, 
I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. One drop of deadly poison added to food or drink will kill a person, and one deadly error mixed with biblical truth will still lead to eternal damnation. Our third point is that Easter is a satanic counterfeit. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Satan tried to deceive Jesus into committing sin, but Jesus rejected him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The word of God is the final authority on all questions related to faith and worship. So what does the Bible have to say about worship and religious festivals? The Bible clearly teaches that God sanctified the seventh-day Sabbath and biblical holy days. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, God said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation, you shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. In Leviticus chapter 23, God also sanctified the annual observance of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. God expects His people to keep His Sabbaths and His festivals. The seventh-day Sabbath and the biblical festivals are a mark or sign that identifies God's people. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. This shall be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. But Satan is a master deceiver who creates counterfeits. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, Paul condemned the false teachers of his day, saying, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. God revealed to the prophet Daniel that four great empires would rule the world before the coming of the kingdom of God. God pictured these four kingdoms as four wild animals. They are Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, the Bible says, This fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws, and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and half a time. The Bible predicts the coming of a Roman government that will seek to alter God's Sabbaths and festivals, and ultimately will lead the world into a great tribulation of three and a half years. However, Jesus and the disciples kept the Sabbath, the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In fact, Jesus used the bread and wine of their last Passover as symbols of his body and blood, which he offered on Passover to establish the new covenant. The early church continued to keep Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread with this new understanding. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote to Jewish and Gentile Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, 
as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. For centuries, faithful Christians continued to observe the Lord's Supper on Passover, the fourteenth day of Nisan, the first month of the Hebrew calendar. Church history refers to them as the Quarto Decimans, from the Latin Quarta Decima, meaning fourteenth. After the apostles died, the church at Rome fell into apostasy. It gradually abolished the Sabbath and biblical holy days and replaced them with Sunday worship and copies of ancient pagan festivals such as Easter. During the Middle Ages, if anyone tried to keep God's Sabbath or refused to observe Sunday, the Roman church would brand them as heretics and turn them over to the state for execution. The Roman church still requires its followers to rest and worship on these days, and the Protestant churches blindly follow Rome, worshiping the beast. These counterfeit Sabbaths are a mark of the devil and his people, just as the Bible predicted. In Mark chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus condemned the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, saying, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Billions of people today are worshiping God in vain. They believe that they are saved, but they haven't taken the first step toward salvation. God doesn't hear their prayers because they are following a man-made religion rooted in paganism, not the Bible. In John chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus explained the nature of true worship to the Samaritan woman at the well, saying, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God will not accept a mixture of truth and paganism. The Bible clearly condemns this kind of worship, and the people who follow this satanic counterfeit are worshiping God in vain. Mardi Gras, Lent, and Easter are man-made traditions that demonstrate the hypocrisy and impotence of this apostate system. Year after year, people use these days as an excuse to engage in public displays of drunkenness, lewdness, and debauchery, and then feign repentance through an empty, works-based ritual, making a mockery of the death of Jesus Christ and turning the grace of God into a license to sin. There is no salvation here. In conclusion, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, and Pentecostal churches are guilty of three sins. First, the rejection of God's Sabbaths and Holy Days, commanded in the Bible. Second, the creation of unauthorized, man-made Sabbaths to replace them. And third, the addition of pagan practices and symbols with these counterfeits. God has one message for people caught in this Babylonian web of lies. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Rid yourself of these pagan, satanic counterfeits and start keeping God's seventh-day Sabbath and his annual festivals as a sign of God's people. 
This is God's promise to those who obey him, and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without profaning it, and who hold fast to my covenant. I will bring them to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer.